السابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار والذين اتبعوهم بإحسان إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Today then we're starting on hadith number 20 عن أبي مسعود عقبة ابن عمر الأنصاري البدري رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن مما أدرك الناس من كلام النبوة الأولى إذا لم تستحي فاصنع ما شئت رواه البخاري In this hadith of Abu Mas'ud Uqba ibn Amr al-Ansari al-Badri radiyallahu anhu he said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that from the affairs that were mentioned from the statements of the prophets in the early times was if you have no shyness or have no shame then do as you please if you have no shame then do as you wish as shaykh al fawzan says hadha hadith azim this is a tremendous hadith aidan also along with the previous narrations qala fihi an-nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in this narration idha lam tastahi if you have no shame wal haya khaslatun azima tamna'u al-insan من الأشياء التي لا تليق به من السفاسف والرذائل وسيء الأخلاق Shyness and having shame it is a trait or a characteristic within a person that is tremendous because having shame having some shyness and shame this great characteristic for a person if you have it then it will prevent you and stop you from doing things that are not befitting from doing things and interacting with people and behaving in ways that are not appropriate and suitable in manners of behavior that are not suitable and appropriate for an individual shyness and shame prevents a person from falling into those kinds of behavior which means that a person who has no shyness has no shame then that type of individual is not prevented from the lowly behavior and etiquette and mannerisms and interactions they will do as they please because they have no shame so the one who has shame it prevents you from evil characteristics from evil behavior from poor interactions and dealings and behavior and manners and etiquette with the people فالذي يستحي يمتنع مما لا يليق so the one who has shame then he stops himself 
from doing things that are not befitting. He will stop himself, his shame will prevent him from getting involved in things that are not befitting. His shame prevents him. And that's why this characteristic of having some shame, having shyness, it is a characteristic from Iman. Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَالْحَيَاءُ شُعْبَةٌ مِّنَ الْإِيمَانِ Haya, this shyness and shame that a person has, it is a branch of Iman. It is a branch of Iman. فَالَّذِي لَا يَسْتَحِي هَذَا دَلِيلٌ عَلَى ضَعْفِ إِيمَانِهِ so the one who shows no shyness or shame in his behavior, in his actions, in his speech, in his statements, then that indicates a weakness in his iman. وَالَّذِي يَسْتَحِي هَذَا دَلِيلٌ عَلَى كَمَالْ إِيمَانِ And as for the one who does have shyness in his affairs, has some shame, then that indicates the strength of his iman. So when the messenger said, "Ida lam tastahi, fasnaq mashit," that if you have no shame, then do as you please. Hada min bab al-tahdid. Mithal qawlihi taala, "Faman shaa fal yu'min, wa man shaa fal yakfur." This is a type of threat, a warning to the people that if you have no shame, you have no shyness, then do as you wish. It's a type of warning to the people and a threat to the people that you are not supposed to be as believers, people who have no shame, people who have no shyness in their behavior, in their morals, in their etiquettes, in how they interact with people, in what they say. As believers, you are supposed to have that shyness in your character, have that shame in how you behave and how you interact and what you say and what you do. And this is like the ayah in the Quran. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ so whomsoever wishes, then let him believe. And whomsoever wishes, then let him disbelieve. Of course, this is not an open option being given to you. Rather, it is a warning and a threat. Those who wish to disbelieve, then go ahead and disbelieve. As a warning and threat to them of the consequences that are to come of that action. فَلَيْسَ تَخِيرًا لَهُ أَنَّهُ يَفْعَلُ مَا يَشَاءُ So this hadith and the ayah isn't in reality or actually a choice being given to you. It's not that the messenger is saying, if you have no shame, then you're okay to go do as you please, it's okay. You're not being told it's okay. You're being told as a warning and a threat. That if you have no shame, then do as you wish. And then you will see the consequences of your actions. You will then reap the rewards of what you do. So if you have no shame and you do as you wish, then you will reap the rewards of your actions afterwards. You will see what the consequences of that are afterwards. فَالْحَيَاءُ خَصْلَةٌ عَظِيمَةٌ يَمْنَعُ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ كُلِّ رَذِيلَةٌ وَيَصُونُهُ مِنْ كُلِّ مَذَمَّةٌ So having this shyness, having that shame, it is a great characteristic and trait for a person to have that prevents you from every type of lowly 
and despicable action and behavior and it preserves you from all types of dispraiseworthy actions and statements and affairs. As for the one who loses his shyness and shame, then that is, the Sheikh says, a great calamity. A great calamity for the one who has no shame. فَالرَّجُلْ أَلَّذِي لَا يَسْتَحِي لا يتحاش الكذب. So a person who has no shame, has no shyness in his affairs, then he will not care about lying. Lying will be an easy affair for him. He has no shame. He will lie unashamedly. ولا يتحاش سيء الأمور والسفاسف والرذائل. And he's not going to stay away from the evil uh, affairs, the evil behavior, the evil statements, and the foolishness and the dispraiseworthy types of behavior and statements. He has no shame. He will get involved in all of the affairs. And perhaps from that lack of shame, he will go and drink alcohol and there is nothing stopping him. He has no shame. Was zina and fornication, was sariqa and stealing, and other than that from those evil actions and behaviors. Fahada fi al hathu al al adabi wa tahalluqi bil haya. So this within it has an encouragement for us to be upon this etiquette and mannerism of shyness, of having shame in our actions and statements and affairs and what we do and what we get engaged in, to have shame in our behavior of shyness. And within it is an evidence for the virtue of that shyness for a person, that shame that a person has وَأَنَّهُ لَا يَأْتِي إِلَّا بِخَيْرٍ And that having this good characteristic of shyness, it will not bring except goodness for a person. It will only bring goodness for that person. وَأَنَّ الَّذِي لَا يَسْتَحِي مَحْرُومٌ مِنْ هَذِي الْخَصْلَةِ And as for the one who has no shame, then he is deprived of this characteristic. He is deprived of goodness. And instead he finds himself in all types of despicable affairs, in all types of affairs that bring shame upon him for the types of behavior, action and statements he engages in. فَلَا يُبَالِي بِمَا يَضُرُّهُ but the one who has no shame, he doesn't care about what harms him. And he doesn't care about what impacts upon his religion and detracts from his religion. And he doesn't care about those affairs that impact and detract from his honor, from his dignity. وَيَقْدَحُ فِي رُجُولَتِهِ And if he has no shame, he will not <coughs> care of the affairs that impact and detract from his manliness, from his manhood. A person who has no shame, then he engages in all of the pitiful activities, all of the, the disgraceful activities, and he doesn't care of what harms him and his character, and his religion, and his honor, and his dignity, he doesn't care. وَهُنَاكَ اِحْتِمَالٌ أَنَّ الْمُرَادِ إِذَا كَانَ الْأَمْرُ لَا يُسْتَحْيَا مِنْ فِعْلِهِ فَفْعَلْهُ إِنْ شِئْتَ فَهُوَ مِنْ بَابِ الْإِذْنِ لَا مِنْ بَابِ التَّهْدِيدِ 
There is another possible understanding to this narration too. That when the messenger said, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتِ That if you have no shame in an affair, then do as you wish. Meaning, the affairs that have no shame in them, that they are legitimate and good affairs to do, then go ahead and do them. The affairs from behavior and statements and actions that are not uh, shameful, they are not affairs that you should be ashamed of then go ahead and do those affairs. The hadith can mean that. Go ahead and engage in the good affairs that there is no shame in them for you to do. That is a possible meaning. But even upon that meaning, it still comes back to the same understanding that the affairs that are full of shame, that you should be ashamed of doing, then do not do those. Then stay away from those types of activities and statements and actions. And this, the scholars, they mention, it is important to understand the character of the Prophet wasallam, the behavior, the etiquettes, the morals of the Prophet wasallam. It is all a part of the religion where a person tries to emulate the messenger, tries to be like the messenger, to learn those characteristics and behaviors and morals and etiquettes and implement them. Just as Aisha radiallahu anha used to say, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ That his mannerisms and etiquettes were that of the Qur'an. And in the other narrations it mentions, أَثْقَلُ شَيْءٍ فِي الْمِيزَانِ الْخُلُقُ الْحَسَنِ The heaviest thing in the weighing scales will be the good manners and etiquettes. And so these types of narrations highlight <coughs> the virtue of that good character. In another hadith, the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ That indeed I was sent to perfect the manners, to perfect the etiquette and the morals of the people. Because prior to his sending, they were in jahiliyyah. They were in jahiliyyah and they used to engage in all types of affairs. And some of those affairs were disgraceful affairs that they would engage in. And so the Prophet ﷺ came with this religion of Islam. And in that religion, he came with the affairs that bring dignity to an individual and bring honor to an individual, nobility to an individual. And you see those characteristics in the Salaf. You see them in the biographies of the companions radiallahu anhum. How they were men of honor and dignity. And they were not people who engaged in acts that you should be ashamed of. Acts that bring shame upon you. They would not engage in those types of affairs. So this hadith, the Shaykh said, is another tremendous hadith. That highlights to us an important message as to how the believer should behave and what he should be upon in his actions and etiquettes and morals and speech. And that's why, like in the previous narrations, it's important that a person thinks before he speaks, thinks before he does anything. Because if a person does not, then you may say things or engage in activities that you then later regret. And they are affairs that bring shame to you. Then the hadith after that, number 21, An Abi Amr. وقيل أبي عمرة سفيان بن عبد الله رضي الله عنه قال قلت يا رسول الله قل لي في الإسلام قولا لا أسأل عنه أحدا غيرك قال قل آمنت بالله ثم استقم رواه مسلم In this hadith of Sufyan ibn Abdullah and it is said his kunya was Abu Amr, and it is said it was Abu Amrah, Sufyan ibn Abdullah. He said that I said, O Messenger of Allah, tell me something about Islam, tell me a statement that I would not ask anyone else besides you for. So the Messenger said to him, 
سه قل آمنت بالله ثم استقم سه برای بلیو ان الله and then be upright I believe in Allah then be upright upon your religion and practicing so in this hadith we see that Sufyan ibn Abdullah the companion radiyallahu anhu he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell him some comprehensive advice some clear comprehensive advice that wouldn't require any further elaboration or explanation and he wouldn't need to go anywhere else to find any more detail on that some clear cut clear cut advice comprehensive advice that he could take on board ولا شك أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أوتي جوامع الكلم and there is no doubt that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was given that ability Allah had given him the ability of the comprehensive speech meaning that he could speak in a few words and the meanings of those words would be great that's what Sufyan ibn Abdullah requested that O Messenger, teach me some basic words that are clear. I don't need any further elaboration, clear cut basic advice with some tremendous meaning within it. So the Prophet وسلم, said to him, <coughs> two very simple statements. The Messenger informed him of two very simple statements. He said to him the first statement, say, Aman to Billah, that I believe in Allah. Aman to Billah. Thumma yastaqim ala dhalika. And then the second word, to then be upright and established upon that. Don't just say, I believe in Allah, but then do nothing and do not practice and do not implement the religion, but rather say, I believe in Allah and then implement the religion. Be upright upon the religion. Be upright upon practicing and obedience to Allah and worship. And this is just like in the Quran, Allah said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا Allah." Those who said, our Lord is Allah. ثُمَّ استقاموا, And then they were upright. They said, we believe in Allah. And then they were upright upon that. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The angels descend upon them. أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا That have no fear and do not grieve. وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ And be given the glad tidings, glad tidings of the paradise that you were promised. They are the ones who say we believe in Allah, and then they are upright upon that and establishing that. وَفِي الْآيَةِ الْأُخْرَى And in another ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Those who said, our Lord is Allah. And then they were upright upon that. فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Then there will be no fear upon them and nor will they grieve. Meaning no fear upon them of the past and neither will they grieve uh, upon the future. Or rather, that they will not grieve upon the past and nor will they, nor will they fear what comes of the future. Ula'ika ashabu jannati khalidina fiha. They are the companions of paradise and they will remain therein forever. Fallahu jalla wa ala amara nabiyyahu bithalika. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded his Prophet with that. وَأَمَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And Allah commanded the believers to be upon that. So Allah said, 
فاستقم كما أمرت ومن تاب معك ولا تطغوا so be upright upon what you have been commanded with and those who repented along with you and do not transgress وقال تعالى لعباده المؤمنين فاستقيموا إليه واستغفروا so be upright to him meaning establishing the worship and obedience and implementing the religion and seek forgiveness from him so amantu billah when the messenger said to the man say i believe in allah that is of course iman iman statement upon the tongue and belief in the heart and actions upon the limbs and this hadith clarifies that because when you say qul amantu billah when you say i believe in allah that is a statement it is a statement of the tongue amantu billah it is a statement upon the tongue وَيَكُونُ مُسْتَقِيمًا عَلَى ذَلِكَ فِي قَلْبِهِ وَيَقِينِهِ وَمُسْتَقِيمًا عَلَيْهِ فِي أَعْمَالِهِ And then you are upright upon that statement in your heart that you have the correct belief in your heart and the iman in your heart and that you are upright upon that statement in your actions. And therefore now you have the statement of the tongue the belief in the heart and the actions of the limbs in saying قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ Say that I believe in Allah, statement of the tongue. Then istiqama, being upright upon that, that is from your heart and on your limbs. And therefore all three of those have come into it in that statement of the messenger. قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ فَجَمَعَ لَهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الْخَيْرَ كُلَّهُ فِي هَاتِينِ الْكَلِمَتِينِ So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gathered all of the goodness for this man in those two statements. قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ Say, I believe in Allah. ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ Then be upright upon that. فَلَا يَكْفِي أَنَّ الْإِنسَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِقَلْبِهِ وَلَا يَقُولُ بِلِسَانِهِ so it's not enough for a person to believe in his heart, but not to utter the statement of shahada upon his tongue. And neither is it acceptable or sufficient that a person says it upon his tongue, but then is not upright in his heart, nor in his actions. Rather, all three affairs are required النطق باللسان الاعتقاد بالقلب and العمل بالجوارح to have the utterance of that statement upon the tongue to have the belief in the heart and to have the actions upon the limbs والاستقامة معناها أن يكون الإنسان معتدلا مستقيما بين الغلو وبين التساهل and being upright means that a person needs to be balanced. Balanced in your practice of the religion, in your implementation of the rulings, that neither do you go into exaggeration and excessiveness on the one side, nor do you fall into negligence on the other side. You don't fall short and don't implement things and therefore become negligent. Neither do you go into excess and exaggeration and over the limits into ghulu. Rather the believer practices his religion in a balanced manner as the Quran and the Sunnah teaches us. Neither into exaggeration nor into negligence. فَلَا يَكُونُ غَالِيًا وَزَائِدًا وَطَائِشًا So a person is not to be someone who falls into exaggeration and extremeness and ta'ish ta'ish is a bit like somebody who he's all over the place a person who's not balanced who's not straight he's he falls into error here error there too much here too much there negligence here negligence there 
He doesn't have control over his activities and in that balanced way. Ta'ish. Here, there, everywhere. وَلَا يَكُونُ مُتَسَاهِلًا مُنْحَلًا And neither should a person go to the other extreme and become negligent of even properly practicing. بَلْ يَكُونُ مُعْتَدِلًا But rather you are balanced. وَلِهَذَا قَالَ اللَّهُ جَلَّ وَعَلَى لِرَسُولِهِ And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to his messenger, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ Be upright as you have been commanded. Not as you make up yourselves as the people do, but as you have been commanded. أَيْ كَمَا شَرَعْنَا لَكَ As we have legislated for you. And then it was emphasized further that you must be upright in the manner that we've emphasized for you. And not to go beyond that, it was emphasized in the ayah when Allah then said, وَلَا تَطْغَوْ And do not transgress. Tughyan is going beyond the boundaries. So do not go beyond the boundaries, neither in exaggeration nor on the other side in falling short. أَيْ لَا تَزِيدُوا وَتَغْلُوا فِي الْإِسْتِقَامَةِ لِأَنَّ الْخُرُوجَ عَنَ الْإِسْتِقَامَةِ يَكُونُ بِأَحَدِ أَمْرَيْنِ إِمَّا بِالزِّيَادَةِ عَلَيْهَا وَإِمَّا بِالنَّقْسِ مِنْهَا So transgression and going too far in the affair is either when a person goes into exaggeration and extremeness in his ibadah and goes over and above and beyond what the legislation has told us to do outside of the sunnah and so falls into bid'ah and other affairs or it is done by deficiency when a person isn't fully implementing and practicing what is in the religion فَالزِّيَادَ يَجِبُ عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ تَرْكُهَا أَمَّا النَّقْسُ فَالْإِنسَانُ عُرْضَةٌ لِلنَّقْسِ وَمَا مِنَّا أَحَدٌ يَسْلَمْ مِنَ النَّقْسِ If a person is falling into exaggeration, then obviously you stop that and do not engage in that any further. And as for a person who is falling into shortcoming and negligence, then no doubt all of us have an element of that. All of us have an element of shortcoming in our religion, in our practice. But that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated for us to seek forgiveness. al istighfar Now we seek forgiveness from Allah for our shortcomings and for our uh, uh, errors. And that's why Allah said, فَاسْتَقِيمُوا إِلَيْهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ And be upright to Allah with your worship and obedience and seek forgiveness from Him. وَالرَّسُولُ يَقُولُ And the Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith in Ibn Majah and Darmi and others, إِسْتَقِيمُوا وَلَنْ تُحْصُوا Be upright and you will never encompass everything. You'll not be able to do everything, but be upright to the best of your ability. لَنْ تُحْصُوا وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ خَيْرَ أَعْمَالِكُمُ الصَّلَةِ And know that the best of your actions are your prayer. The establishment of your prayer. وَلَا يُحَافِظُ عَلَى الْوُضُوءِ إِلَّا مُؤْمِنِ and nobody guards over their wudu except a believer. فَقَوْلُهُ إِسْتَقِيمُوا وَلَنْ تُحْسُوا So when the Prophet ﷺ said, be upright, and you're not going to be able to do everything, لَنْ تُحْسُوا أي مهما عملت لن تُحْسِ الدين. No matter how much you do, you're not going to implement and be able to do everything. In the religion, فَالدِّينُ كَثِيرُ وَالْأَوَامِرُ كَثِيرًا The religion is expansive and there are many affairs within it. وَلَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَحْصُلَ مِنْكَ تَقْصِيرٌ No doubt you're going to fall into some shortcoming in some aspect here or there. لِأَنَّكَ عَبْدٌ ضَعِيفٌ فَعَلَيْكَ بِالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ So you are a deficient servant of Allah. And there will be some deficiency in your actions here or there. So in that case, Allah has obligated upon us, legislated for us, al-istighfar, and we seek forgiveness from Allah for our shortcomings. لِأَنَّ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ يَمْحُوا مَا يَحْسُلُ مِنْكَ Because seeking forgiveness, it wipes out whatever deficiency occurred from you. وَيَجْبُرْ مَا يَحْسُلُ مِنْكَ مِنَ النَّقْسِ 
and seeking forgiveness from Allah compensates for the shortcomings and deficiencies that may have occurred from you. فَالِسْتِقَامَةُ أَمْرُهَا عَظِيمٌ So الْإِسْتِقَامَةُ Being upright upon the religion is a tremendous affair. فَالْإِنسَانُ لَا يَغْلُوا وَلَا يَجْفُوا So the person does not exaggerate nor fall into negligence. So when the messenger said in this hadith, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ Say that I believe in Allah and then be upright. Then that is from the comprehensive words of the Prophet ﷺ. From the comprehensive words, meaning they are just a couple of small sentences, two short phrases, and yet they have that tremendous meaning and fiqh in them, in belief in Allah and Iman, and then being upright upon the religion, in practicing and implementing the commandments and the obedience to Allah and the worship. Then one more narration we'll cover today. The final one is less is a, a narration 22. عن أبي عبد الله جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري رضي الله عنهما أن رجلا سأل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا رسول الله أرأيت إذا صليت الصلوات المكتوبات وَصُمْتُ رَمَضَانَ وَأَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالَ وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامَ وَلَمْ أَزِدْ عَلَى ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا أَأَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ قال نعم قال والله لا أزيد على ذلك شيئًا رواه مسلم ومعنا حرمت الحرام اجتنبته ومعنا أحللت الحلال فعلته معتقدا حلة in this hadith, Abu Abdullah Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, <coughs> رضي الله عنهما, he and his father, he said that a man asked the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man asked the messenger, asked him, Ya Rasulullah, O messenger of Allah, أَرَأَيْتَ إِذَا صَلَّيْتُ صَلَوَاتِ الْمَكْتُوبَاتِ If I... The man said to the messenger, O oh messenger, if I pray all of the obligatory prayers, if I pray all of the obligatory prayers, وَصُمْ to Ramadan, and I fast Ramadan, وَأَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالِ and I implement and practice that which is halal, believing it is halal, وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامِ and I stay away from the haram, knowing it's haram, and I don't do anything more than that. I establish my prayers, I fast Ramadan, I do the halal, I stay away from the haram, and nothing more than that. Will I enter paradise? So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Naam, yes. So the man said, By Allah, Wallahi, la azidu ala dhalika shay'a. By Allah, I'm not going to go over and above that. I will establish the prayers, I will fast the Ramadan and do all the halal and stay away from the haram and stick to that. Of course, within that then comes the other pillars of Islam. Everything is in that halal and staying away from the haram. So this man was asking the messenger, inquiring, if I do that, then will I enter paradise or not? If I stick to the five daily obligatory prayers, meaning... If I don't even pray the supererogatory ones, I stick to the five daily obligatory ones, and I fast the obligatory fasting of Ramadan, not the optional, anything optional, and I do all of the halal and believe it to be halal, and I stay away from all of the haram, believing it to be haram, will I enter paradise? The messenger said, yes. فَهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ فِيهِ أَنَّ مَنْ أَدَّ الْوَاجِبَاتِ وَالْفَرَائِبِ the meaning of this hadith is that a person who performs and carries out all of the obligations, because the man was talking about obligations, the obligatory prayer, the obligatory fasting. The point is a person, a believer who carries out all of the obligations upon you and leaves all of the haram, 
and suffices with just the halal in terms of the food and the drink and other affairs, then that individual will enter paradise. He fulfills all of the obligations, stays away from the haram, sticks with the halal, he will enter paradise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran spoke about the different levels of the believers. And we've mentioned that before in previous sections in the hadith of Jibreel. You remember the circles. The biggest circle is the circle of Islam. But then when a person moves up in levels, he gets to the level of Iman. Then as you move up and up, you get to the level of Ihsan. So there are different levels of believers. This man was saying, if I just stick to the basics, I fulfill the obligations, I stay away from the haram, I stick to the halal, fulfill the obligations, will I enter paradise? And the answer yes. If you do that, stick to that even as a minimum, and you don't do any haram, you stick to the halal, fulfill the obligations, prayer, zakat, sawm, etc., whatever is upon you, then you do that and you will enter paradise. So Allah has told us about the three levels of the believers in the Qur'an. One of them is, it's in the ayah, فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ Fatir, ayah 32, that is the three levels of the believers. The first level, ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ هُوَ الَّذِي يَقَعُوا فِي الْمَعَاصِ دُونَ الشِّرْكِ That is the one who falls into sins but not shirk. Falls into other sins but not shirk. That type of person who commits sins but not shirk. Then he will be under the will of Allah on the day of judgment. Allah may forgive him and he goes straight to paradise. Or because of those other sins, not shirk, other sins that he did, he may be punished for them first and cleansed from those sins first. But then eventually he will still go to paradise because from the sins he did not have any shirk. The second type, al-muqtasid. And that is what this hadith is talking about, the second level of the believer, which is this level known as al-muqtasid. And that is the one الَّذِي اِقْتَصَرَ عَلَى الْفَرَائِضِ وَلَمْ يَأْتِ بِالنَّوَافِلِ وَتَرَكَ الْمُحَرَّمَاتِ وَاكْتَفَى بِالْمُضَحَاتِ A person who fulfills all of the obligations but doesn't do any supererogatory optional things necessarily. Fulfills the obligations. Leaves all of the haram, sticks to the halal. Then that person is a muqtasid of that level. And he enters paradise. And the third type, as-sabiqu bil khayrat, is the highest level. That is the one who does the obligations and the supererogatory and the optional. Stays away from the haram and the makruh, not just the outright haram, but the makruh things as well. The disliked affairs, unrecommended affairs, stays away from them too. And maybe even some of the mubah, allowed things. Maybe he stays away from some of those as well because maybe he takes his time or other affairs. Even some of those things he stays away from as a precaution. That type of person is at the highest levels. So the believers do not go outside of these three levels. كُلُّهُمْ فِي الْجَنَّةِ All three of these levels will be in paradise. Uh, as Allah mentioned, جَنَّاتُ عَدْنٍ يَدْخُلُونَهَا يُحَلَّوْنَ يُحَلَّوْنَ فِيهَا مِنْ أَسَاوِرَ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ وَالْأُلُوَىٰ وَلِبَاسُهُمْ فِيهَا حَرِيرٍ How they will be in gardens of Eden. They enter and then they are uh, 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 given garments and clothes and bracelets of gold and, and, and diamonds and pearls. And their cl- clothes will be of silk. All of these types of blessings that they are given in paradise. Even the first level, the lowest level of them, they will be in paradise. As long as they did not commit any shirk or kufr, then ultimately every believer who died upon Tawheed will end up in paradise. 
Even if they had sins, they may be punished for those initially, but then after that, once they are cleansed from those sins, they will enter paradise. So here the man was asking about that, if I stick to the obligations, stick to the halal, stay away from the haram, just minimum at that, would I enter paradise? The messenger said yes. But then we understand there are higher levels above that, sticking to the obligations, but also the supererogatory and optional, and staying away from the haram, but also from the makruh. So a person can strive further than that also. But this highlights that the believers of Tawheed, upon Tawheed, will enter paradise in the end. That brings us to the end of that narration. That's where we'll stop for today. We'll start next time, inshallah, on hadith number 23. Hadith of Abu Malik al-Harith ibn Asim al-Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu. So we'll stop on that for today then. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.